Hello, my name is Sean, and I am with a project called Edible Acres, which is a permaculture nursery and food forest research space in central New York. We're in the Finger Lakes area, Zone 5B, a cold temperate climate nursery and growing space. And this is part two of a four-part series of a deep dive into permaculture-focused plant propagation ideas. I put on a workshop this past summer, in the summer of 2023, and shared these ideas, and I'm re-recording this for free for general public use. Um, my hope is that this lands as useful to some folks to help accelerate their propagation goals. If you do find it useful, my first and foremost hope is that you take it and run with it, that you grow more plants where you live. Secondarily would be to share it with other people. Uh, and then third, if it feels compelling to you, I do have a PayPal link, which will be in the description, where you can offer a tip if that feels nice to do, but please feel no pressure. I just hope this gets more people growing more plants where they live. So without further ado, this is part two of our propagation workshop in depth uh, with the permaculture lens. What I'd like to focus on in our second session is terms, tools, and techniques. Um, and at the very bottom of this first slide, uh, I'll put this in the description as well. Let me hide myself for a moment. There's a blue highlighted link. This will be a link to this presentation that will be available for free indefinitely. Um, so you can make a note of this and return to the slideshow for your reference. So if I go through a particular slide a little bit faster than you would like, if you want to read things at your leisure, make a note of that and you can come back to it. So let me go through here. So uh, in this session, what I want to get into, uh, I want to talk about terms that are commonly used in permaculture or in propagation um, aspects, and specifically some of the vocabulary that people use just to kind of demystify that. So for folks that are just getting into this to understand certain uh, language and lingo that people might use, um, I'd like to talk about that in this presentation. I really want to focus on some of the tools that we use in the work that we do, uh, human scale tools that are accessible that might be worth considering investing in if you're going to be propagating plants at any sort of scale. And then we're going to talk about some techniques, some ancillary, is that the right term? Some secondary and supportive um, techniques and infrastructure that might facilitate the process of doing plant propagation. And we'll talk a little bit at the end about our chicken system and how that generates fertility, some food for thought for folks that might wanna fold that into a project that they're doing. So the first section we're going to get into is terms. And so if you're really familiar with um, propagation already, I will endeavor to put a table of contents in the description and you might be able to skip past this and get into the tools and some other areas, bop around as you please. Uh, the description will have uh, each chapter broken down, so feel free to hop around. Uh, but let me get into this, the easy intro to propagation language. So again, if you, let me hide for a moment, if you uh, miss something in this and you want to review it, feel free to look at that link and read. I want to talk about some ideas here around two different types of propagation. There is clonal propagation, which we're going to go in our third session with this in great detail around hardwood and softwood propagation techniques. So these are ways of making identical photocopies of plants. Uh, very useful if you want exact replication if you want certain specific numbers of a very particular type of plant. Sexual propagation is more the realm of seed growing, which I'm going to talk to uh, talk about in some depth in this session and more in session three where we go deeper into that. And the pro there is you can collect seed at great scale. You have extreme open genetic diversity in this pathway, and you can really increase numbers of plants pretty astronomically. And one of the cons is that you do have a lot of variation in how the plants express. And so sometimes that's not exactly desirable. We tend to err on the side of preferring to grow more plants from seed rather than cloning, but both have a lot of value. If I mention the idea or the term propagule, that is a part of a plant that is used for propagation. And stratifying and scarifying are both techniques to help break dormancy in plants. We'll get into that in greater detail in a little bit. Bear with me, this is text heavy at first, and then we'll get um, a lot more images as we go. 
Some methods that we use quite a bit is uh, hardwood propagation, which we'll talk about. We use bottom heat periodically, which helps uh, stimulate a warm root zone for the cuttings and a cool above ground uh, space that helps promote rooting before they start growing. Willow, elderberry, currants, forsythia, poplar, goji berry, interestingly, surprisingly, all very, very easy from hardwood cuttings. Uh, softwood, um, using mid-season growth where plants are actively growing, they're in a green state. We'll look at some examples of that. And then stool layering, which is hilling material around the base of a plant, allowing it to facilitate uh, rerooting from stems down below. Not unlike potatoes for annual crop producers, but uh, in our case, it allows each of the stems to produce more roots and more growth that you can then divide. And all of these are considered clonal propagation. Just to see some visual examples here, this is an image of some hardwood propagation. The right image is elderberry cuttings. You can see that they are just starting to grow. These are dormant sticks pushed into the earth and starting to uh, develop their growing process, which we'll look at in greater detail. On the left, it's kind of a messy image, but that is uh, elderberry cuttings after one year of growth. They can get up to three or four feet tall in our systems. It's a really robust way to propagate lots and lots of plants uh, that are amenable to that dormant propagation. Softwood, here you're looking at on the right, some sea berry cuttings in the middle of the season. You can see things are actively green and growing. And in that case, you require, they require support. They require mist or bubbling water, which we'll look at in more detail. But just to see some examples here very briefly of some of these things as we're moving along while it's fresh in your mind. And stool layering, you can see here I am snipping away. Uh, it looks like honeyberry. Um, this was uh, woody plants that had a bunch of material plant uh, buried up against the stem for a year or two, and they root into that, which we'll see more of in a bit. Now, seed is something I want to spend a fair bit of time on here and talk about some techniques for storing seed that are very, very accessible for folks that are just getting into it. In this image, you're looking at English walnuts or Juglans regia. My friend Eric here is helping me uh, get these seeds ready for winter stratification. In other words, storing them for the long winter so that they can be ready to plant in the spring. One way you can approach this is with a bucket. So I'm going to go through uh, step by step if you really want to save some seeds and protect them from rodents and be able to bury them outside even in a very cold climate, a challenging climate, you can do so with materials you find for free. So in this case we're looking at a standard five gallon bucket and this one had a crack in the bottom. You can see Maybe you can see my mouse there. And so it no longer held water. So I went ahead and took a drill and drilled some holes in the bottom, some holes in the lid, roughly the diameter of a pencil or more, somewhere in that ballpark, and a fair number of holes. You don't want them too large so that rodents can get in. You don't want them so small that uh, they clog up and don't allow moisture through. Very, very simple though, and you can do that part for free. Here, what we've done is in that bucket, we filled it with layers of wood chips and compost and hazelnuts and random cloves of garlic. And so this was collecting the hazelnuts in the fall and mixing them with garlic just in the outside chance some rodents got in there. We'll pop the lid very tight on top of that, uh, put a little bit more compost on top or some soil. You can even see a red wiggler on the left there. So it's a very living soil. And we can take that bucket with the holes in the bottom, holes in the top with the, the lid uh, tightly applied to the bucket and bury that outside deeply in leaves or in well-drained soil under a pile of wood chips and pull that out in the spring to plant. It's actually one of the simplest ways to go about cold, moist stratification of tree seeds that could be impacted by rodents. It's incredibly easy. It's something you can consider doing for next season for sure. Some tools that we've worked with uh, extensively over the years that I think are particularly helpful, something to consider investing in. Very, very clearly, we are not sponsored by any of these folks. Um, we just believe in them. We buy these tools with our own uh, nursery capital and encourage other folks to consider them. So Okatsune pruners 
Uh, that is the pruner on, in my left hand, so it's on the right of the screen there. You can find them online, very, very high quality. Um, they last for an incredibly long time, and they're about the same price as Felco, which are the pruners in my right hand on, on the left side of your screen. Um, and yeah, I, I stand behind them. Okatsune pruners at this point we use extensively, hundreds of thousands, if not maybe uh, approaching a million cuts on a few of these pruners, and they still work beautifully for us. Something to consider investing in. A good nursery spade goes a very long way in helping you dig trees or rooted plants as they grow. In my hands, in this particular case, is a tool called the King of Spades. You can search for this online. They're not cheap. They're somewhere around $80 to $100. So if you're just getting started, maybe skip um, this tool until you've done your first year of growing these plants and then see if it's something you need. But we use them absolutely every season. Um, I, I use it constantly in the spring and the fall. Very, very strong tool, very um, useful at getting trees out of the ground. If you're going to be doing any sort of marking of nursery pots or labels, I strongly encourage uh, Listo as a great nursery pen. You can get these for 2 or $3 a piece. They have refillable wax uh, tips that you can put in there. Um, they are an old company, really great old school nursery. You could consider using wax crayons, uh, carpenter's pencils, or carpenter's wax pens if you don't want to invest in these particular tools. But they're non-toxic. They, the markings last for years and years. They're fantastic. Hori Hori is a tool that we use extensively. It is a small hand tool that allows you to do uh, really great division and uh, propagation work with herbaceous perennials or small woody perennials. I do a lot of weeding with this. I break up soil with it. It's basically on me most of the, the growing season. In this case, I'm using one from A.M. Leonard. Uh, I love their tool, but I hate the fact that they keep sending me um, a color catalogs, so you might be able to find one from a local spot. What you definitely want to do is make sure it is a tool with a stainless steel shaft or a blade and that it has this flared uh, aspect to the handle so that your hands can't slip up the handle. It's a, that's a, that's a, an injury you want to avoid. I use a scythe quite a bit during the growing season to maintain uh, pasture area and weediness. I like a tool from One Scythe Revolution. I use the ditch blade of theirs. It's a more expensive tool. Uh, but lasts for years and years. It's a multi-generational tool if you take care of them. Uh, Scythe Supply is another um, company you can look for online out of Maine, and they are less expensive. It's a great beginner's option and something to consider for a fossil-free, a fossil fuel-free tool that also allows you to harvest huge amounts of mulch. They're, they're pretty wonderful tools and they're a great exercise. It's an old picture of me here using a nut wizard. You can search for this online. I believe it is a USA, a made in the USA uh, family company, and they let you harvest nut seeds very, very effectively. Really great tool in the toolkit for those of you that want to grow nut trees at large scale. I'd like to cover a little bit some concepts around moving water. Of course, you can do so with watering cans, and I'll show some examples of types we like to work with. You might also consider, I've made some videos about this, I might document this in more detail if there's interest, um, but exploring the idea of very, very low cost, very low complexity solar panel and bilge pump combinations. Uh, so in this image, what you're looking at is a small solar panel I got used with a bilge pump. We'll look at that in greater detail in a moment. Um, just some numbers to think about. If you were able to find a used, it can have cracks in it, 100 watt solar panel from Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or Kijiji or wherever you might be, uh, a used solar panel, an 800 gallon per hour bilge pump can do immense work of lifting water from a uh, nearby pond or a rainwater tank and using it to irrigate plants. So something to consider, you don't really need to know electricity very much or deal with batteries. It's very, very simple. Um, in this case, what we're using quite a bit is a bilge pump. This is a very haggard and simple way that we put um, a filter on it. I just take an old door screen and wrap it around the bottom of the bilge pump, 
modify the stem in a way where we can attach a garden hose to it and we're off and running. If the sun is out a little bit, I can attach some alligator clips from the bilge pump onto an old battery from a car or into a solar panel, whatever I need to do and move water. But the direct solar is quite satisfying to have the battery, the inverter, all that stuff out of there. Simple pump, simple panel, you can go from there. Um, you can see two different examples of pumps that we use, uh, the kind of the full scale of the pumps that we use. The top one lifts 2,000 gallons per hour. It's probably about $50 or so, maybe a little bit more. Um, but it also needs 100 watts of energy in order to run so that you need a, a bigger panel for that. The one on the bottom, slow and steady, will run on just about the tiniest solar panel you can imagine, uh, and it lifts about 10 feet, very, very slow, but it will fill IBC tanks, it'll move water from a pond into a reservoir, so it's a great, slow, gentle transfer pump or a way to move heated water through a garden bed. The technology is out there, you can get these used um, or in bulk, and really it's not very complex, and at 12 volt, the systems are very safe. You can't really hurt yourself with these. If you don't want to go down that route, we use watering cans extensively. We use rainwater tanks of all sorts. Uh, in this case, we're using a metal galvanized stock tank. And you can see two different um, watering cans that we use extensively. Super cheap. The red one on the left is a red watering can we got from a box store for $5. Has a little rose water on the tip for seedlings. On the right, we have a watering can. I think I found this on the side of the road, and I use my pruners to snip the tip of it off, and I call that the sawed-off watering can. And you can use that to dip into compost tea or other murky or unfiltered water and really, really deeply, deeply soak plants with that. So you can skip the pumps entirely and move water just with hand tools or uh, simple tools like this. Let's talk a little bit about some techniques that can help facilitate your propagation goals. So we'll talk a little bit about collecting rainwater and a little bit about some of the propagation uh, bed systems that we work with, hardwood and softwood, and demystify that and make sure folks feel really empowered to very easily enter into this. Um, for what it's worth, I mean, pretty clearly, I think, but I have absolutely no formalized training with all this, I just figure it out as I go along. Uh, and basically, if you have access to some basic hand tools and some information and some recycled or repurposed components, you can more or less do anything that we're demonstrating here at whatever scale you feel is appropriate. So I hope, I hope you come away from this ready to explore some of these ideas. Let's talk first about bottom heat um, if you search on our YouTube channel for bottom heat or propagation, I think I have a playlist for propagation. You can watch a video on the construction of this. But basically what you're looking at is a box that has some sand. There is a, an electric um, soil heating cable that's buried in the sand and um, some bricks are used to kind of pin it down to evenly distribute that throughout the sand and then once that sand is in there and the cable's laid in, we put some more sand on top, sometimes perlite, sometimes a lightweight potting mix. Um, and you can see here, once that's plugged in, we set the, the temperature to 74 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, keep it gently watered. And this is in a garage where it's unheated in the early spring. And this stimulates immense amount of rooting and callusing in advance of the growing season, which is super helpful. But you can do thousands and thousands of cuttings in, in a relatively small space. Here I probably am pointing at about 500 to 1,000 cuttings that are all being stimulated to root with bottom heat uh, of dormant hardwood cuttings at the very beginning of the growing season. And you can see what we're trying to do is stimulate callusing, which is what you see in my hand there. That's not perlite attached to the bottom of the cutting. That's the beginning of rooting on these cuttings here. That looks like it might be an elderberry variety. Um, and this can work well on plants that are a little bit harder to root. So it's something to consider. Low cost, it's about a hundred bucks or so. Uh, you could definitely just use a... Um, Sorry, you definitely just use a simple um, seed starting heat mat 
and put some pots on there. That works just fine. You don't have to uh, build anything. Here we are uh, looking at a softwood bubbler. Again, if you look on our propagation playlist or if you search for softwood in our videos, you can see this demonstrated. A little hard to decouple what's happening here, but you can see on the bottom left, I have an image. This is a very simple aquarium bubbler and we're using aquarium bubbler rocks. And in this container is um, collected rainwater with aeration. The bubbler is in there stirring and creating a healthy, cool, oxygenated water. And we have a whole bunch of cuttings, in this case of seaberry and willow that are rooting together. The willow helps release uh, some rooting hormone that um, stimulates better rooting for the seaberry, and the two of them can root together. And here you can see um, the seaberry pulled out, the little white roots starting to form. This in the middle of the summer, this is probably August, late July, August, when these were taken. They are um, in the bubbler until they start to thoroughly root, and then they're moved into a nursery bed with partial shade where they're protected and they're watered daily until they start to actively grow. So a fair bit more steps involved in this whole process, but it can help you root some very high value plants that would otherwise not really want to root within your system um, from hardwood. Here's a technique we've talked about extensively on the channel. Again, search for air prune um, in our videos if you want more details. This is a way to grow huge numbers of trees from seed. Um, it allows you to grow on any surface. So this image is taking place on our driveway. Um, this, uh, these three boxes are all hazelnuts. There's probably 200 hazelnuts in each one of the boxes and it'll protect from rodents as well. And in the fall you can take it all apart and put them away and reclaim a parking space or use it to create new garden space in your landscape. We happen to use um, modular units that are two feet by four feet predominantly, but you can also use one foot by two foot. And you can see on this image, these are four of the one foot by two foot boxes next to each other. So one, two, three, four makes two feet by four feet. So the same cap can work on um, either a single box or four of the little boxes. That's just something to consider. Scale it to whatever is appropriate for your applications. We like to prepare our materials in advance. Um, in this case, you're looking at a bunch of black locust that was pre-flighted where we um, uh, broke it down into the component parts. We've got our fencing all organized, our battens for assembly, again, documented in other videos, but that allows us to make these at a scale that's really useful for us. We like to use black locust because we have access to it where we live. Uh, I would encourage you to not use pressure treated if you can avoid that. Um, but maybe there's uh, hemlock or larch or white oak or some other nice material. Maybe you can reassemble pallets if that's what you have access to. Here you can see we're uh, deploying them right on a lawn. Um, this will help us erase the lawn within a growing season or so. And we create these risers. You can see our friend Wand here is putting on a second tier. You can do a third tier so the beds get deeper and deeper. And they decouple the plant's growth from the earth. You can see there's a mesh on the bottom. Once they're filled with soil, uh, the plants, the trees, the seedlings will grow down, hit the mesh, it cauterizes or prunes, air prunes the root system of the tree, and then they make a more fibrous secondary root system. And you get incredibly nice, robust, small, but sometimes two or three feet, but really field ready, uh, compact, powerful root systems on these trees in exchange for not even, not even having to dig. We fill with some good material when we can, but we'll also fill with debris. And here, in this case, we're digging a pond, so we put some muck at the bottom um, and then filled the rest of the way with nice material, nice potting mix. Uh, in this case, we have uh, 150 or so, maybe more English walnuts, so they're planted very close, but they grow very, very well covered for rodent protection. This uh, area then gets deeply mulched around them in the, uh, in the spirit of erasing the grass that was there. And we'll get around a few thousand trees from an area like this. It's not very large, but very, very high value. 
you can see here we are taking the risers apart so uh, you can just slide one or two of them off and reveal the trees and you can pull them out by hand which is extremely nice for, uh, <laughs> a nice relief from what is normally very intensive digging we can just get a shovel underneath a little to help pry but most of the work is done by hand I'd like to talk a little bit about collecting water I think it's something that is relatively important for life to exist so it seems nice to be able to collect it from the sky and use it for your plant propagating endeavors um, here we're looking at a very a pretty simple IBC tote uh, system we get our IBC totes used in our case there's a local Amish ice cream factory that we we're able to get them for $75 a piece look around you can see where you live there's probably somewhere to get them for ideally less than hundred dollars you just want to make sure there's not chemicals that were in there before um, you can be creative and scrappy in how you uh, capture rainwater so this is reclaimed gutter that was being torn off a home uh, diverted with another little piece of whatever that metal material is and um, sent through a, a simple half-inch hardware cloth mesh that um, pre-filters enough of the material to keep the IBC tank from getting too cloudy or too dirty. So clearly not much in the realm of new stuff here. In fact, I would argue this entire setup is reclaimed material. Um, you can see the scavenged gutter. It's got some tears and rips and bumps in it, but it works just fine enough why buy new stuff when you can find a lot of things being thrown out? Um, we've talked about um, in other videos the idea of IBC tanks being unified or um, uh, paralleled. So this is, uh, if you search IBC in our video list, you can see examples of us plumbing, of uh, myself plumbing these together. But this is scavenged garden hose with really simple fittings that you can find online um, new or you can make yourself if you need to. Um, if you are going to be using an IBC tank you do need an, uh, a bulkhead adapter. Kind of going down a rabbit hole with this a little bit but I'll just touch on it for a moment. Each IBC tote has different types of threading. There's two inch cam lock, there's coarse thread and fine thread. Do a little research before you commit to a design pathway for converting the IBC tank into garden hose ready if that's something you want to do. In this case you can see I made my own out of um, some PVC step down stuff. You can go to a local hardware store and describe what you're trying to figure out and they can help you out with this for sure. Something to strongly consider if you search online for uh, garden hose float valve or something along that line you can find this little gray unit here for about three dollars or four dollars a piece maybe a little bit more if you buy them individually um, this is something we've just used in the last few years it's not unlike the float valve in a toilet bowl um, this allows us to take our rainwater collection and have it flow into tanks where we can then put a bilge pump to send water into a high tunnel or we can dip in with a watering can. Uh, it automates the refilling of tanks and helps distribute water in the landscape without wasting it. Um, for three bucks or so, very worthwhile. Last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about um, a technique you may consider if you have chickens or maybe you have other animals in your system already or there are animals nearby. We, we work closely with our chicken allies um, to generate compost for our system, especially uh, in the spirit of propagating plants. It's really nice to have uh, an ever-increasing amount of fertility in the landscape, and it is expensive to buy it in. So we have chickens do a lot of work for us and with us. Um, you can see here our, our hens are working on waste food scraps that we bring in from local restaurants and food co-ops. Um, they work on that mixed with wood chips and leaves and hay and straw. This is something we've documented extensively uh, on our channel. If, if you're not already familiar with it, you can definitely find lots and lots of examples there. Um, we bring in food scraps even in the dead of winter. 
This is, uh, these are reclaimed totes we get from a reuse store. We fill with food scraps, bring them back. And even in a landscape that looks like this, in, uh, in a winter run made basically an old scavenged high tunnel, um, we have enough heat from the decomposition process to have it function all winter. Feeds our hens really nicely and in the spring we have beautiful age, not perfectly finished, but nicely aged compost that we can add to our propagation beds and help grow some beautiful plants. So wrapping up here, um, I'd encourage you to think through some of these questions, some thoughts here. Um, what resources and tools can you imagine needing to get started? So if you feel like it would be compelling to develop a permaculture focused uh, nursery or propagation project where you are, what do you need to have that happen? Feel free to share some of that in the comments, have some dialogue with each other, or just ruminate that uh, about that for yourself and think about um, where can those come from? Can they be found locally? Can they be found for free? Um, can you borrow them from people just to get a, a toe in with this and see what's going on? Um, if you do have intention to propagate cuttings, um, would you want to be doing bottom heat or softwood? Would it be hardwood or softwood? Do some research on the best techniques for propagating the plants that you think you'd like to propagate. What sort of materials and resources do you need to have in place in order to do so? Where would you do that? Is it going to be in a garage? Do you have an unheated barn, basement? Um, you get the idea there. Softwood propagation, what sort of materials would you need to do that? I would strongly encourage starting with hardwood, starting with very easy plants, elderberry, currant, willow, get a feel for it, get, a, get some positive reinforcement before you start exploring softwood propagation with a hardy kiwi in a, in a hot, dry climate. So um, make it easy for yourself, get that positive feedback first. If you do think you want to grow trees from seed, what sort of uh, infrastructure might you need? You certainly don't need air prune boxes in order to uh, grow trees, but if you think you might want to have them, what do you need to get together in order to do that? Is there lumber where you are? What sort of materials? Um, and water security, very important. How are you going to secure more water? Is it hand dug ponds? Rainwater collection, is that something you can explore where you are? Some thoughts there. And how can you be generating more nutrient uh, for your propagation goals on your own site? Is it bringing in wood chips and leaf bags, manure? Is it working with animals that you already have in your system? Just some things to consider. And with that, it brings to conclusion our second in four part series around permaculture propagation ideas. Session number three will be an in-depth look at propagation methods. We touched on them just to get some ideas flowing, uh, but we'll talk in much greater detail about all the different techniques that I know that I've worked with over the years that facilitate plant amplification. So hopefully you'll join us for that. And the fourth session is thinking through actionable steps of like, if you do want to start a nursery, if you want to start propagation at scale, what, uh, what are some things to consider? What are some limiting factors? What are some ideas to fold into your design process to that end? Please let me know in the comments um, questions that you may have, uh, concerns or feedback around the quality of this or ways that it can be improved. I'm always interested in that for sure. If you like this content, please share it with other folks. Best thing you can do in my mind is grow more plants and share them out into the world or make a living with it. That's awesome. If you feel so moved, um, we have a PayPal link, which I will show right here, that um, you can throw us a tip if you'd like to do that. Please do not feel any pressure to do so, knowing that people are growing more plants out in the world is the main compensation that I would want from this. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Take care and happy growing.